Yeah, thank you. Very, thank you again for the opportunity to talk about this very interesting topic. As Esti had said, initially when we went about looking through the topic, it seems very superficial. Is a yearly gynae exam indicated? Because as obstetricians and gynecologists, you would expect that this is actually your bread and butter, and uh, you hope that people come in for this. But what we wanted to do was look at this more deeply and see where the evidence is. So basically the content of the talk, the what, why, and how of the talk is going to be on the definitions. What are we talking about when we say a yearly gynae examination? What are the statistics and the background to this yearly gynae exam? And has anything changed from what we used to do before to what we do now? Why an annual visit? What is the evidence of the content of this entity we call an annual visit? And what is the future of the annual visit? So when we talk about definitions, there's actually quite a large number of references that we can go through to try and decide what do we define as a annual gynecological visit. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have three committee opinion articles based solely on what we want to define as an annual gynae visit. And a very interesting article by Dr. P. Swat in the ONG forum as well. Basically what the evidence shows is that when we talk about a yearly gynae visit, we're talking about a well woman visit. Not a visit once somebody has a sign or a symptom, PV bleeding, wants a review of something. This is a well woman. Somebody who's got absolutely no complaints, but is required to get a yearly gynae exam for one or other reason. We wa we're talking about a yearly review of either screening or counseling and a focused examination based on age and risk profile. And this is what we want to attack, basically, and see whether this is necessary or not. It's not really the patient that we encounter in this tertiary setting because our patients are referred with a specific complaint. So that's also very interesting because, especially with that article by Dr. Swat in the ONG forum, it's called office gynecology for a reason. It's not what we see. It's what the private gyne your everyday private gynecologist has to see. So when I looked at the background and the statistics, basically my aim was to see why is it that we do a gynae exam yearly and what is done and why do we do the things that we do, basically. So the main... Uh, Statistics, what I found was that we have a certain set of data from pre-2000 and a certain set of data from post-2000. Most of the articles that I got, obviously, were American-based. Very little evidence in South African setting for office gynecology and a yearly gynae review. But what we get from the American side is that pre-1997, the main focus of a gynae examination was blood pressure check, breast exam, pelvic exam, and a pap smear. That was the hallmark of all the systemic reviews that they did on articles. And that the conclusion pre-97 was that evaluation of the accessibility and cost effectiveness of this general medical and general gynecological exams to deliver preventative services to different populations is needed because they don't really know whether what we're doing is necessary. So in the American population, basically what they did was they looked at the two national uh, population surveys and looked at the reviews that were done by the physicians and the gynecological uh, doctors. And basically what they found was that a vast majority of them, so they divided it obviously amongst age, and they divided the the review into examination, test measured, and counseling. And as you can see, across the board in all of the ages, a vast number of them got a full breast, pelvic, and rectal examination. So up to 70% from the ages of 18 to the ages of 64 got a pelvic examination when they went for a gynae review. In terms of tests and measurements, up to 70% got a pap smear, even from the age of 18 to the age of 64. And counseling, much lower levels of counseling being done by the gynecological 
doctors and from the physicians. This review article then assessed the exact same data years apart. So this one is a review of uh, patients from the years 2002 to 2007. And although it also shows that there is a high number of patients that are still being reviewed, the number has dropped drastically from previously where it used to be in the 40s and 50s percent, it's now down to about 20 percent. And as you can see from the numbers, there is actually a drop in the percentage of patients that are presenting to, to, for a gynae review. And the number of tests still remain quite a large percentage. So pap smears, PSAs in males and mammograms are still a very high percentage of examinations that are being done at all age groups, basically. And the counseling part of the examination is still very underrepresented. In terms of percentage of actual tests done, there's also been a drop um, of tests being done. So whereas before we were seeing 80% patients getting breast examinations and pap smears, that percentage had dropped in a physician-led examination, still quite high in a gynecological-led examination. So when I looked at the data, what I had seen is that there was a shift from doing the full gynae examination with a full pelvic examination and a speculum and a pap smear to a decreased number. So I wanted to see why there was this shift. And I wanted to ask myself, what would we be looking for in an annual visit? So the main entities that I looked at were risk assessment, screening, and preventative services. Those were the main core elements of a review. And the questions I had were, would a set annual gynecological appointment be necessary? Or should we be screening when somebody comes with a health encounter? So they've got a, a, a medical complaint, they present to a physician or a gynecologist a doctor, and we do the full preventative screening at that stage. Are there improved patient outcomes when we do a yearly gynae review? And is there a risk of overdiagnosis and treatment and an inappropriate use of resources when we review people yearly? So the most or the change basically that happened is in, in the American setting basically is the Guide to Clinical Preventative Services. This was a, since the 1998, which is when I basically saw that change in the cutoff of what examinations were being done, is that in 1998, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality convened the US Preventative Service Task Force. And their basic aim was to look at what we deliver in a health review, basically. Broke it down into what we do on history, what we do on examination, what we do on in, uh, special examination, and what we do on counseling, and looked at the evidence to see whether what we're doing is evidence-based or are we just following the numbers and doing what we used to do? So they differentiated the evidence um, into grades. So grade A would be where the evidence shows that there's a high certainty that the net benefit is substantial and they would actually offer these services at every visit. Uh, keeps going down at evidence B is there is a high certainty of net benefit but there is moderate certainty that the net benefit is moderate to substantial. And then C is where we look at the patient individually and weigh up the risk versus benefits and offer if there are other considerations to take into view. And group D and group I are where basically they say they discourage this sort of examination or investigation in a health review. So I divided them, so they've got about 110 different aspects of a clinical review that they have assessed all the literature for with systemic reviews and assessed with these grades whether it is necessary or not. So with their evidence, the grade A and grade B recommendations for history is that we screen for alcohol use and counseling, we screen for depression, 
We screen for intimate partner violence. We do an HIV screen, and we screen for tobacco use. Those were the main ones that they found as being evidence showing benefit rather than risk. And they basically have it in a table form for all the evidence that they accumulated on the data. So they've got one for the alcohol, they've got one for depression, they've got one for HIV infection, and they've got one for the intimate partner violence. For examination, their basic uh, recommendation is for hypertension screening, obesity screening, and breast cancer screening. What obviously comes out with the history and examination is that it is an American-based, and obviously the increasing in obesity uh, epidemic and pandemic in America is guiding this as well. So you are obviously seeing people there with higher BMI, and they're doing a lot more of the hypertension, obesity, and breast cancer screening. Then when it comes to testing, they advise that we test patients who have screened positive for hypertension with a type 2 diabetes screen and testing, lipid disorder screening, osteoporosis screening for women over 65, sexually transmitted infection screening, specifically chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, and cervical cancer screening. So and that's basically the evidence for it. When it comes to grade one recommend or grade I recommendations, the ones that they are not advocating but asking that we individualize is type two diabetes screening if the blood pressure was normal, counseling for sexually transmitted infections, and thyroid disease screening is not recommended unless there is an individualized factor. And what was interesting in grade D recommendation, which shows that there is harm that outweighs the benefit, coronary artery screening with an ECG, asymptomatic bacteria, ovarian CA, and menopausal hormone therapy. So one has to remember that when we talk about the recommendations, they're talking about the well woman visit. Not a patient who has presented with a specific complaint. We're talking about your everyday person who presents to a health facility with a review that basically maybe the company wants a review and they're doing a well woman visit. So once I looked at all of this, I wanted to see if they've now synthesized all this information and given a guideline whether we should be doing the test that we're doing. And this systemic review was actually from uh, 2004. So they basically looked at all the literature pre-2004, from 1973 to 2004, basically. And what they found was that they basically synthesized 50 articles, of which 10 of them were randomized controlled trials. And they found that the evidence suggests that primary health examinations improve delivery of some recommended preventative services and may pay, lessen the patient worry. And the long-term benefit analysis is still lacking, so we don't really know whether we are helping with the investigations that we're doing. The Cochrane Review, which was also done in 2012, had a different view in that they wanted to assess whether there was benefit and harm in a more longer term and to focus on the morbidity and mortality associated with the investigations we're doing. And what they found in the 15 randomized trials that they assessed was that there was no reduction in morbidity and mortality. And this is, if you remember, all the guidelines that they were telling us about, whether to screen for cervical cancer, whether to screen for ovarian cancer, looked at everything and found that there was no reduction in morbidity and mortality when we had this yearly review of patients. And there was an alarming increase in number of new diagnoses that basically proved to be not beneficial once we've made the diagnosis. So they've, for example, assessed uh, patients getting routine ultrasounds on a yearly gynae exam and for, to look for ovarian CA. And they found that doing that basically causes a new diagnosis of possibly a cyst and then investigation based on that, and then ultimately no advantage to finding that cyst at all. And obviously they also say that the harmful outcomes 
in the future have not been studied or reported. Once we got all of those information out, the one thing that I found that was missing was specifically for us, because all of those investigations are basically ones that can be done by your primary health care physician, your private GP. Specifically on our side, we basically, if they come to a gynecologist, the basic health review that we do is a pelvic examination, and with the pelvic examination, screening for sexually transmitted infection and screening for cervical cancer. And this review was also done by the American College of Physicians, and they also, looking at all the evidence, recommend that a pelvic examination in an asymptomatic, non-pregnant adult woman is strongly not recommended because the findings are not going to lead to a specific management strategy. The, there was also an Australian article also with the exact same thought process looking at the literature from the past and they also reviewed all the health examinations that are done at a gynecology uh, practice and they also found that routine pelvic examinations are not necessary for any of the investigations that need to be done. So because I couldn't really find evidence in our setting, I, we basically went about and looked for anecdotal evidence. So we inquired with um, the five main hospitals that were in the north and southern suburbs. And we asked the gynecologists that were from Stanford University, basically, so easy to contact. And we asked them, what do they basically do in terms of this gynae review? Is it necessary? What do they do? How much do they charge? And what do they feel is necessary and what isn't? And basically, the vast majority of them had a similar core view that a gynae examination in terms of a full gynae examination is not necessary for a well asymptomatic patient. They charge up to 1,500 rand for a full gynae review. It's not including when they do the pap smear as well. So that's 1,500 rand that they're charging for investigation that we are saying is not necessary. And what their main review is that they would not stretch that yearly review to longer, though, because they want to change what they call a yearly gynae review from a full gynecological examination with a pelvic exam and a breast exam, etc. But the other aspects of a gynae exam are still very important, the preventative aspects. So counseling about STIs, counseling about contraception. Those, to, those type of things still are important. But most of them would say that a full review yearly would not be necessary. So if you look at all the evidence, it suggests that moving away from a full routine pelvic examination and unnecessary testing is the way forward. But is the value of counseling and screening also not vital in what we want to practice as biopsychosocial model of practicing medicine? Because although we are discounting the full biological review, we still need to review the psychological and social model of practicing medicine. So I wanted to see why it is that we still, at some stage in some institutions and in some places, still persist with a gynae review that is yearly. And basically what I wanted to look at is what are the, what as a gynecologist do we look for and why are we doing it as a gynae review yearly? And this uh, review in preventative medicine basically looked at the perceptions of the gynecologist and they basically asked 520 practices why they would still consider doing a gynae examination yearly and they wanted to see where, what they found was important. And the striking feature is that from during the reproductive age, up to 69% of gynecologists that were reviewed said that a yearly gynae review is still absolutely essential. And that after menopause, 55% said that a yearly gynae review of those patients is absolutely essential. 
When asked why is it essential, basically they divided it into patient consequences and clinician consequences. And what is important is that the perception of the, the physician or the gynecologist is that there would be an absolute decrease in contraceptive service provision, patient health and well-being, and patient satisfaction. More than 70% said that was the main reason why they would still want to do a yearly gynae review for patients. In terms of clinician consequences, they say that the clinic volume would decrease. At least 92% said that that would be one of the main things. And that their visit length, although you make it not a year, you make it three years, would actually lengthen further if you tell them, no, you don't have to come back next year. And job satisfaction and financial reimbursement obviously would also decrease if we were to not make it a yearly review. The conclusion was that longer intervals between routine examinations would have negative repercussions for patient and for medical practice. But there were obviously differences in the region, practice, and personal characteristics, which is actually what we found in our small little survey of five doctors here as well, is that they also found it regional and some aspects important, some aspects not so important. So if we look at everything, what then is the future of the annual gynae examination? Are we still going to go forward knowing that the evidence shows not to do a full pelvic examination, not to screen unnecessarily for, for uh, STIs and infections and for cancer, etc. This article basically in the Journal of Women's Health from 2011 looked at the certain aspects that we were all talking about. Pelvic examination, uh, provision of contraception, cancer screening, ovarian cancer, pelvic examinations, are there adverse consequences? And basically what they found was exactly what the American college found, is that there is no role in routine testing for sexually transmitted infections. There is no role for pelvic examination for provision of contraception because irrespective of the only contraceptive agent that needs a routine pelvic examination would be an intrauterine contraceptive device. And there's nothing on a pelvic examination that would preclude you from continuing with your contraception. Role of pelvic examination for cervical screening, we know even in the South African guidelines, it has changed from there is no need for a yearly pap smear unless there are certain circumstances. And we're actually looking for a pap smear once every 10 years. So why an annual review for that? We all, we all know that the pelvic examination for detection of ovarian cancer is very poor and that it was actually a classified as, as a risk. And we also know that there are adverse consequences of routine pelvic examinations because we do unnecessary tests and it obviously has cost implications. And the question that it all goes towards is do women avoid the pelvic examination? Will they have a problem in the future and decide, no, we, I really don't want to have that exam again and then delay the presentation till they actually get something even worse? So their main outcome was that routine pelvic examinations may be an example of service leading to worse outcomes. And it's time to get the asymptomatic woman completely off the gynecological table because we need to perform speculum examinations less frequently and completely do away with the bimanual examination in an asymptomatic woman. And this is, as I said before, routine practice in many of the European and American setting. So in conclusion, if you look at all the evidence, the value of a full yearly gynecological review is not really justified. There's no evidence for it. Evidence-based reviews find great value in preventative counseling and risk assessment. But for it to be cost effective, does a individual have to go specifically to a gynecological doctor to get the full review? Because even at a general practitioner, you could be doing preventative counseling and risk assessment. And should we not then be relabeling the yearly gynecological review to a yearly preventative screening? 
review. And obviously, as with all aspects of medicine, individualization is the key. Thank you. You know what they've done in their lives, but obviously that will be too personal. But um, uh, I don't think many of us will probably also uh, uh, follow the rule of a yearly full gynecological examination if I could just speak for myself, but in any case. Um, um, before, I've got a few things that I, questions I've brought it down, but maybe there's a question from the audience. Okay, Zoe. Um, thanks, Kevin. I think it was a very um, interesting topic that's um, definitely got a lot of merit to discuss. Um, I want to say um, the word doctor comes from the Latin word um, docere. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but that means to teach. And I think um, if we can remember that, it's one of our main things. If we can impart health knowledge or health um, promotional behaviors to patients, I definitely think it's worth the money, the 1500 bucks to get health promotion things. I don't know about the accept um, or health promotion information from a doctor, but um, particularly individualized health promotion behavior or um, information. I don't know if patients will accept um, going and paying a lot of money in the private sector and they say that doctor didn't even touch me mm. I'm not, uh, that might be one issue from the p patient perception issue um, and one other thing um, it's quite interesting to note in Chinese medicine um, at a general practitioner level um, you pay your doctor on a retainer every month to provide you with your herbs or whatever you need, um, when you get sick you stop paying your doctor because it means he's failed <laughs> he's his job, <laughs> so it's a, very, it's a very different concept but just the idea of education I think is, is a big one to put across and I don't think that should be underestimated it, um, it probably is, um, has a huge effect and keeps the cost down as well. Just, just on that point as well, if you... Thank you, Zoe. You just one moment, the, Kevin. Oh, oh, don't worry, I've got... Oh, you've got your... <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the, where the evidence was from, the vast majority of the articles that I found were all physician-based articles, not in the specific gynecological articles. They are all from... Annals of Physician, the Amer Australian Physician, uh, uh, none of them were actually by gynecologists saying we should maybe not do the yearly examination. The only article where they went out to the gynecologist was the one where they were reviewing what, the, what their perception of, and it's exactly as you said, the vast majority thought that if we don't provide this yearly review, they are going to lose out on the other aspects, the preventative medicine, the contraception, the sexually transmitted infection counseling, etc., which is very interesting. But that's why on, the, on my last slide I asked, should we then still be calling it a yearly gynecological review? It's got a negative connotation. A uh, gynecological review, if you ask 100 people outside, will say, well, that means breast exam, pelvic exam, and a pap smear, and that's what we should be going away from. Anybody else, Prof? Uh, th thank you, Kevin. I think you set a good example of how to remain objective towards uh, your um, investigation yeah. on your topic and, and provide an objective report. Um, I, I do, however, think the American literature, we should not be too much focused on the American literature because the health service in America is the most expensive on the globe. If you take it for the entire population, they spend 18% of their GDP on health, and they've got much worse health outcomes than, for instance, their neighboring country, Cuba, who spends a pittance on health, and they've got much better outcomes. Um, so it's not a good example. Um, I think um, countries with national health, like the Scandinavian countries, probably would be a good example. And what I learned from a visit to Sweden is that they've got a, a social health service, but patients need to filter through primary care facilities, which could either be a doctor or a, a, a registered nurse, and then from there be referred upwards. So the, the, the patients are all registered with some other primary health care provider. The only exception is women with gynecological complaints. If a woman has got a gynecological complaint, she can refer herself directly to specialist level of care. And I questioned this, and they said, uh, well, well, now I'm not a woman, so I won't know, but they say a woman knows if there's something wrong with her. 
gynecologically. And, and in that sense, they accept that form of, of referral. Their, their, their health service also is much, much cheaper, um, taking the cost from their GDP and their health outcomes, of course, are exceptionally good. Um, however, in South Africa, if we, and I take this from Stefan's PhD thesis, thesis, if I may, Stefan, but the most expensive health service on the globe, nowhere else is it more expensive, is the private health service in South Africa. If you take the amount of people they service and the cost of the service, it's the most expensive service on the globe. So again, that's not a good example. And then just a very last remark, I know of a private practice in Belleville that was sending notices to women, it's now time for your annual gynecological, and they got in trouble with the HPSA. That it, you're not allowed to do do it. You're not allowed to to lure patients to your practice. So that this is um, so at least that message has got out to the HPSA. They don't want people to do that. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, do you want to comment on that, or are we going to ask for more questions? Or more comments from the audience. Thank you, Kevin. I just want to make uh, maybe ask, do you think that <coughs> cost involved is related to quality <coughs> of care in a country? So if you look at specifically in terms of a gynae review, I would not think so because it is exactly as somebody said, if a patient were to go to a gynae review, pay 1500 and walk out saying, all the doctor did was tell me about contraception, which I can get from Google, told me about uh, sexually transmitted infections, which I can get from Google, and told me about what, uh, you know, contraception is important. They would most probably walk out saying, I'm not going to go back for 1600 So I don't think we we feel that in order for us to give a service that is all encompassing we're going to have to do something extra which is why we end up doing the speculum exam which is why we end up doing the pap smear but for a well woman who is not at risk for any of these things i don't think we're adding any value for that very high price that they're paying and i think that if you go to a gp who i think charges about 350 rand for a consultation will most probably give you exactly the same amount of information without any of the extra fuss. And the patient won't, won't think, no, well, a GP is not supposed to do a speculum on me, so I'm, I'm okay with him not doing it. I think that's, that's the main issue, is that we are, we are basically overpaying for such services. But what I'm actually asking is, say, for example, we come to something practical that we do. We screen for uh, cervical cancer. And we have a screening program where you have three visits versus uh, a first world, call it the first world country, where you can actually go for a yearly visit. So if you look at the sensitivity and the specificity of that, of that test, and then you look at the cost effectiveness, will it make a big difference if you go every two to three years for your pap smear versus three in a lifetime? No, uh, sorry, can, can <laughs> Kevin? <laughs> yes, I, I can attempt. Maybe I can attempt and then we will get. I think the main reason why we went from the yearly review to the review once every 10 years, three times, is that we have found that the value of doing it every year is very little. The uptake of patients with cervical cancer specifically, with pap smear reviews yearly, is not particularly good, which is why they made it once every 10 years, because we know that the pathophysiology of HPV is such that you're not going to go from a absolutely normal pap smear to cervical cancer within that period of 10, 10 years. And at the moment, if we're talking about first world countries, they don't really rely specifically on the pap smear because now they do HPV testing as well. And if that's negative, then there would be no indication to do the pap smear yearly at all, actually. 
Yes, and also the HPV testing can be done by the patient themselves, yes, which means they don't tests. need a speculum and all yeah. that. Prof? Um, no, I don't want to add very much. Just to say that with HPV testing, if we do primary HPV testing, the interval between a um, test can safely be increased um, to five years, and many people say ten years, mm -hmm. because the sensitivity of and the negative predictive value specifically of a um, um, negative HPV test is so good that that interval um, can be increased significantly. So it all plays in the same direction that we don't need to do an annual um, uh, examination anymore. The next question is, has it been implemented? Well, the national policy on cervical cancer screening is now um, in a very advanced stage, um, and we'll probably move to um, HPV DNA testing as a first line. I just want to um, mention, I actually saw in one of the recent SMJs, there was a little letter that someone wrote about um, their thoughts on the ethics of uh, specialists seeing patients who were not referred by um, a primary caregiver. And I think that's something that we don't think about because you're seeing a patient that you don't maybe know the long history and context of and you've seen that patient once and maybe not sending that patient back into a facility where they're actually getting full supportive care and then charging a patient a specialist fee for examinations that can be done in private. So I think it's also an ethical thing to think about. Is it, is it good practice to see patients for services they don't need and then encourage them to come back for more mm. of the same? Thank you, Annalisa. Oh, that's absolutely true. And then I also just wanted to mention that when Kevin gave the talk, I picked up the only recommendation that they say is a, is a recommendation A and B is osteoporosis screening of women after 65. And I've had a few ladies, especially in the River Hospital where I've got my own sort of cl big clinic there every second Tuesday. I've got many patients that have these kind of requests they don't have at Tigerberg. So they, I've had a few women that ask me when they're older than 65, but do I, do I, how do I know they don't have osteoporosis and shouldn't they be screened for that? And then I always feel a little bit so I don't know. That's probably also a cost, a cost factor why we don't implement that. Um, and then the other comment I wanted to make is that I spoke to Kevin about it as well, is that feeling also is from the doctor's side. Like f from my side, if I see a patient, I'm always, I always feel that maybe nobody else, if I don't do it properly. Like I, I worked in the Northern Cape for a long time, and I think it grew. I, I got to be that way when I worked there for five years because people, you always saw the person when they had the advanced cervical cancer. There wasn't any screening going on at all. So it's almost like you feel this responsibility towards every patient to screen them for everything and just do the whole thing for everybody. But I think the point is that it's not necessary. If you see the older woman with a prolapse, they don't need an ultrasound as well. Um, to screen or to look if there's any ovarian masses. I always feel, let me just look, she's easier now, maybe she's got one. I've got that kind of attitude, but I've revisited that attitude. I think I'm going to try to, to, to be more evidence-based with that as well. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, tea time, and we're going to go and see the rep.